Welcome to this lesson about the Bible. This is the first of two lessons that's really going to challenge many people and help us to get off those glasses, to help us to come into the life we read about, to help us to understand what the Bible really is, what the Bible is saying, how to understand the Bible, and to know who God is. And today we are going to talk about something really interesting. We are going to start to look at the Pharisees, how they had the scripture. They were studying, they were exa examining the scriptures daily. They were waiting for the Messiah and when he stood in front of them, they couldn't see him. They were blind. And one of their problems was they were picking up the fly, but they were swallowing a camel. And I'm going to talk about what that is. And we are going to look at the Pharisees and also that the Bible in itself do not have eternal life. No, the Bible is testifying about Jesus so we may come to him to have life. And this is the difference between the Pharisees and the early disciples. They were living this life. They walked with Jesus. And because they walked with Jesus, they could speak with authority, with a boldness. They were uneducated, unlearned, ordinary men like you and me, but they still spoke with a boldness and they still knew what they were talking about because they walked with Jesus. I'm going to talk about their life and then we are going to come in and introduce some of the things with chapters and verses and what we are going to talk about next time. That chapters and verses have destroyed the Bible and the way we read it. So I know you will love this teaching. It's going to help you, challenge you, provoke you, and you're going to love it. God bless you. Look forward to share this. Hi, hi. Hi, welcome to this lesson where I'm going to talk about the Bible. We are going to look at scripture and verses in the Bible and, and, and how the Bible in many ways have got destroyed. And we read it in a wrong way, to say it like that. We, 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 many people read the Bible in a wrong way. And what I'm going to share today, I think is really, really important. And this is one of the most important lessons. I have come with onto now and it's also a lesson that's going to challenge many of you but it's also a lesson that's going to set many many people free when it comes to those religious classes and how we read the Bible. I was in South Africa a short time ago, no it was actually not there but I met a couple I don't remember where from South Africa and they were a pastor in a church and they have been in church many many years. And remember the wife said to me at one time, Torben, how is it I can be in church my whole life, but when I found a pioneer school, like everything you are saying makes so much true, truth, but it's new for me. It's like I've never heard it before. And I would say, how is it? How is it people can be in church the whole life and hear teaching after teaching, sermons after sermons the whole life, and still, there is many, many things they have never seen before. One of the reasons for that is what I'm going to cover in this teaching. And one of the reasons that the Pioneer School have really changed many people's life is some of the things I'm going to cover here also. And I want to say this is a little my secret, some things that have helped me to set me, me free personally to understand the Bible, to see the Bible without those glasses on, and to come in and live the life we have in the, in, in the book of Acts. So I hope you are ready. I'm ready. I look forward to it. Uh, I will just pray. God, I thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you for, for your life. And thank you because we are seeing a movement all over the world today and life is getting changed. Jesus, we love you. and We want to obey you and we want to know you and we not want to know your word. Come and open our eyes and our ears today and set us free and help me to share what you want me to share in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, we're going to look at different things. The Bible is a really exciting book where they put together 66 books, 40 authors, three continents, three languages, 
over 1600 years. But before we go and look more at the Bible, we are going to look at the religious people, and then we are going to look at the contrast between the religious Pharisees and the early believers, disciples, how they are living. So here I have like teachers of the law and the Pharisees, and I put the word in religious people here. We have the teachers of the law, and when Jesus walked around here on earth, he spoke to people. And one of the things he spoke to the religious people, it was not, uh, it was not always what we call kind words, because Jesus was really, really radical toward the religious people. You can read about that in Matthew 23. One thing he said to those people was, you guide the people, but you are blind. And it's really a problem to be a guide and be blind at the same time. And that is why I wrote religious people, because there's also people today who is trying to guide other people, but they themselves are blind. And then he said something here. Think about a man picking a little fly up of his drink, but then swallow a camel. You are like that. What do he mean with that? What do he mean about a man picking up a little fly of his drink, but then he swallow a camel? What the problem with the Pharisees was that they went into the small details of the letter. So they went into the letter and tried to like, hey, pick up. No, we don't want it. This is wrong. This is wrong. So they went into the small detail, but what they forgot was the big picture. And this is what is often the, also the problem with many people today. And you're going to see that later, that what we often do, we, we go in, in the word, and then we go into the small detail and, and there's things we become blind by because we focus so much on the small thing, then we don't see the big picture. And this is a big, big problem, not only for the Pharisees, but this is a big problem today. And you're going to see that later. He also said, you Pharisees, you are hypocrites. You close the way for people to enter God's kingdom. You yourself does not enter, and you stop those who are trying to enter. And I, to be honest, I've often think a lot about how Jesus spoke to those religious people, Pharisees, because I have many examples today also of religious people who are try, who are hindering other people to enter into the kingdom of God. I have a friend here who, who I baptized a few years ago and he got set free. His story was that he was seeking God and one day he came to that understanding. Also, he, he, he was reading in the Bible and heard things. So he came to that understanding he needed to get baptized on his own faith. What did he do? He went to a Lutheran pastor. It was the only thing he knew and say, I need to get baptized, I need to repent, I need to get baptized. And the Lutheran pastor looked at him and said, but are you baptized as a baby? He said, yes, then everything's okay, you don't need more. And, and this, is, this is closing the kingdom of God for people. They do not enter themselves, and those people who want to enter, they actually close the door for them. So Jesus was really radical against the Pharisees. What was the problem with the Pharisees? One of the things we read, they are blind. We read that they were going into the small, small details so they did not see the big picture. And, and we see that they were closing the way for people. But one of the things that was really, really, really the problem with them was this. He said that you examine the scriptures careful. Because you suppose that in them you have eternal life. Yea, they testify about me, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. So Jesus is saying to them that you are searching the scripture. You are examining the scripture carefully. Because you think there's eternal life in them. There's nothing new under the sun. There's not eternal life in this book. 
This book is testifying about Jesus. That we may come to him to get life. But there is people who are searching, who are examining the scriptures in a way that they get blind. <laughs> they are examining it because they are trying to find some small truth and something in it. And when the truth is standing in front of them, they don't see it. It's like Jesus, they were waiting for Messiah. They were searching the scriptures. They were examining the scriptures. They were waiting for Messiah to come and save them. And when that Messiah was standing in front of them, they didn't see it. They were blind. And this is what can happen today also. If we, if we just introduce the word without introducing the life, Jesus. People actually, by examining the scripture, by studying the scriptures, actually can study themselves blind in a way. And I'm, I'm going to come into that. But here you see some of the problem with the Pharisees. And then we will look at the early disciples. And I wrote here the early disciples. And then I wrote, walked with Jesus. Because this was some of the things they did. You can read about the early disciples' their life, and in Book of Acts 4, they have just prayed for a lame man who was healed. And there were now Peter and John in front of the Jewish counselor. And when they stood there, we read this in Acts 4, 13. When the Jewish leaders saw the boldness of Peter and John and found out that they were uneducated an ordinary man, they were amazed and realized that they had been with Jesus. The first thing we see here, when, when the Jewish leader saw the boldness of Peter and John, what was it that was special with Jesus also? The religious people and, and, and the other people, they saw there was a difference. Jesus spoke with a boldness. He spoke with a boldness, not because he was bold and just spoke loud, but he knew what he was talking about. He spoke with a boldness. He was different, Jesus, than the religious people, and people saw that. And the same thing here. Now the Jewish leader, they saw that those people, <laughs> they spoke with a boldness, and it surprised them. And then they were surprised because those people here, they were uneducated and ordinary men. They have not, they did not have seven years of university. They have not been on Bible school their whole life and been studying. They were uneducated men. They were ordinary men. But what happened? The truth was they have been with Jesus. And this is where things is happening. This is where we are growing. The Word of God don't have life in itself, but the Word of God is testifying about Jesus so we may come to Him to have life. And those people who really would speak with boldness, those people who knew what they're talking about, it's not those people always who have been on university and sitting there and starting seven years. This is those people who have walked with Jesus, like the early disciples. And, and at the same time, they were, of course, of ma amazed because they saw the power of God, they saw the lame man standing beside them. And when we talk about teaching also, those people, they were studying, 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 examining the scriptures. Those people, they were uneducated men, but being uneducated is not the same that they did not know the word, because they knew the word. Who was teaching them? Of course, Jesus was, but we also have the Holy Spirit who are teaching us. And John, in, in John, uh, the letter of John, he's saying this, but the anointing that you have received, and he's talking about the Holy Spirit there, that the Holy Spirit you have received abide in you. 
And then he says something interesting. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as he's anointing the uh, Holy Spirit, teaching you about everything, and it's true. So you don't need anybody should teach you. In that way that in the old covenant, they needed people who could go and teach people. They, they needed people to go through, who could tell them what to do. But now we are living in a new time, in a new covenant, and now we have the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit who are teaching us. And I would say that you get so much more out of being seven years walking with Jesus, listen to the Holy Spirit, than seven years on a university, just examining the scriptures. The truth is you can be in university seven years or six years and study the scripture and don't find Jesus. There is a lot of proof of that today, and this was the problem at that time. So when we talk about the Bible, we have to understand it's not just about the word and the letter. It's about the life. It's about coming to Jesus. And you can also not really fully understand the Bible unless you are born again. And this is what Jesus said to, to Nicodemus. Jesus said to Nicodemus here, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, he was, he was teacher. He was the teacher in Israel. He was Pharisee, but the teacher. He knew the scripture. And here Jesus came to a guy who, if we would pick somebody who knew the scripture, we would pick him. Everybody would pick him. If you went to the crowds and say, who know the scripture in this country? Everybody would point at Nicodemus and say, this guy, he know the scripture. And Jesus then met him. And what did Jesus say to him? You cannot see the kingdom of God. He said to that guy who had been in the scriptures his whole life that you cannot see this. You cannot understand this unless you are born again. And he did not even understand that because Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, you are Israel and Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things. And no, he did not understand it. Why? Because the Bible is spiritual also. We have to understand about the word that the word is is life. You cannot understand the word with a carnal mind. You cannot understand the word if you are not born again. It's like a whale. You, you, don't, you, you can see the letter, you can understand the letter, but you don't understand the spirit behind the letter. And, and Paul, he said something about that, like in Corinthians, First thing, when he talked about the false prophets, there were some issues in Corinthians, uh, in Cor Corinth, and Paul, he wrote about that. He wrote, but I will come to you very soon if the Lord is willing. And I will then find out not only who those arrogant people, or how those arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but on power. So when Paul came to them, he wanted to see the life, not only the words, because it's so easy to have words, it's so easy to have theology, but there is no fruit, there is no life. And he continued and he said later, Now we have not received the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is from God. So we may know the things that are freely given to us by God. These things we also speak. So we speak. But not in words with man's wisdom teaches us. But with the Holy Spirit teaches us. Explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. 
So we are using words. We are speaking. I am speaking. I'm speaking, but it's not human words. You learn by just studying a university with a human wisdom. This is what the spirit is teaching us. And there is a difference between that. I'm going to continue and go back to some of this later. Because I want to say something. I think we do a mistake when we present the word to people and not present Jesus. People need Jesus first. They need to be born again first before they can understand his word. They need to experience him before they can understand his word. Because if you only start with the word, you read it, but it's like you don't get it. But when you experience him, when you meet him, when you experience the life and first have the life and are living the life and then read his word, then it's explode because then the word is life. And I come with something same from my own life. I write here, I wrote here, meet Jesus, then read his word. If I look at my own life, How much did I know of the word before? I knew absolutely nothing. I had a friend, I was with a friend and I came into his room and there was a Bible laying on his bed. And I was like, my friend Tommy, I was like, Tommy, you have a Bible. What do you do with a Bible? Are you crazy? What is that? And he told me a lot of things. He told me about Jesus and what he had experienced. And I, in the beginning, thought he was crazy because I did not understand it. Then he said, Jesus is coming back. And he told about Judgment Day and what Jesus was coming back. So I went home and I was thinking, Judgment Day, Judgment Day, Jesus is coming back. And it actually scared me, of course, at that time. So I was thinking, whoa, Judgment Day. So I went home and I found a Bible at home in my parents' house. And I took the Bible up and I thought, Judgment Day, Jesus is coming back. I want to read about that in the Bible. So I opened the Bible. And, and I did not know where to start. And I was thinking maybe there's like a place where you can read Judgment Day or so on. So I took the Bible and I wrote, he opened it and I saw Old Testament. Okay, Judgment Day, Judgment Day, Jesus coming back. Judges, the book of Judges. Hey, Judges, Judges Day. Maybe it's, it's, it's because that is where we can read about Judgment Day and Jesus coming back. So I went in the Old Testament to the book of Judges to find out about Jesus. And us who know the Bible, we know we don't find a lot of things about Jesus and Jesus coming back in the book of Judges in the Old Testament. It was how little I knew about the Bible. I did not know the New Testament, the Old Testament. But what happened? I met Jesus. The Holy Spirit came and changed my life. And then I experienced life. And I remember the first thing I experienced, I jumped on a bicycle, I was on the way home, and I felt something had happened. And then I was like, I felt, what, what have happened here? And I've always been afraid of dying. But now I was like saying to myself, Tom, you're going to die one day. And then I was like, yeah, yeah. I'm going home. And, and, and I was just set free. That fear of death was just gone. I felt it in my body. Then I went home and later I read in the Bible in Hebrews that Jesus, fear of death, that Jesus came to free those who was like slave all their life because of the fear of death. And I read it and when I read it, I was like, yeah, this is what I have experienced. I have felt it on my body and then I read it in the Bible and, and it just became like, it just becomes so real for me because I knew now that the Bible was not just a book because what I experienced, I read there. Another thing that happened right away was that I had like, before when I prayed to God, I felt like a big wall between me and God. It was like he was not there. And as soon as I repented and the Holy Spirit came, it was like that wall was just taken away. Like God, he, he was there. He was now listening to my prayer. And then I read this. 
It is your sins that separate you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so he does not hear you. And I have experienced that, that those sins was taken away, so that wall was now gone between me and God. And I could know him. And, and, and it was so strong for me. And, and, and the next thing I experienced right away was that I, I could not go on sinning. It was like when I did things that were sin, I felt so bad. Nobody came to me and said, Tommy, you may not do this, you may not do this, you have to stop doing this, you have to stop doing this. No, I, nobody told me that and I did not read it in the Bible. I did not read it in the Bible because I was not a big reader and it took some time for me to start to really get into it. But I felt it in my body. I experienced the life. The Holy Spirit had done it. And then when I read the word, no one who has been born from God practice sin. Because God's say, seed abide in him. Indeed, he cannot go on sinning because he had been born by God. When I read this, born from God, when I read this, I was like, yes, this is what is happening. This is what is experience. This is, this is life. But now we have many, many people who are reading the same scriptures. They are studying the scriptures, but they try to get it in. They try to... Try to make theology out of it because they have not experienced the life. And the Bible is a living book. Let's say like that. The Bible in itself do not have life. But the Bible is talking about living people like you and me, but people who have experienced Jesus. I want to challenge you. I can say a lot about that. I want to challenge you. The early disciples did not have a Bible. They did not run around with a book called the Bible. They did even not have the Old Testament. Yeah, they have it as big scrolls and they read it. But Paul was not walking around with those big scrolls from the Old Testament when he was on his journey. Paul did not walk around with a small Old Testament in a book or the New Testament because there was no New Testament. It was just getting written. So the early church did not have the Bible the way we have it. And that is the facts. And we sometimes forget that. But how could they survive by the Holy Spirit teaching them? By the Spirit convincing them the truth? Like I experienced, I experienced it, I experienced it, I experienced it, I felt it, God spoke it, and then I read it, and it became confirmed. And it is a challenge for us today. <laughs> what I'm saying, but this is the truth. And we need more of the Spirit again. We have today Father, Son, Holy Script. But in the early church, they have Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And we need to understand the Bible. What The Bible is supposed to point to Jesus so we may come to Him and get life. And the Bible, I don't, I think we get lost in the Bible because we don't understand how to read the Bible. Come here, example. There's people who, who think that we women should cover their heads when they pray because Paul said that in Corinthians. I don't believe women should cover their head when they pray. Don't you think so? No. But, but, but Paul is saying that in Corinthians to us. No. This is the mistake we do. Paul did not write the book of Corinthians to you and to me. He wrote the book of Corinthians to the church in Corinth. So he was dealing with issues and matters that concern them. And you see that the Bible is part of their culture. And there was a cultural thing involved in all of that. 
And to understand the Bible, we need to understand the history behind it. If you take Corinthians, there is two Corinthians, the first and second, but that is actually the third and the fourth, because there is four books, but we only found two of them. But also, we only have the hard part of the story, because when Paul wrote those books to those people, letter to those people, he wrote as a response to a letter he had got. So we only have the hard part of the conversation. But Paul is dealing with a matter they have already wrote to him. And he's answering that. And if you go in and read a dictionary about the book of Corinth, about the story of Corinth and the church and the book, you can find out that the problem was that there was an issue between the Jewish Christians and the Greek Christians. And the Jewish culture, tradition, was the women public should wear a veil and the women should sit in the back end when they were gathering. But the Greek Christians did not have the same traditions, the same issues, so they were more free in it and it created a fight. So Paul came in to those people in that place and wrote to them and said, this is the issue. I tell you, do this and this. And I say, God says, do this and this. But that because God said it to them, don't mean that God said it to everyone. Because this was what they needed to do to fit in, to have peace. But you have to understand, Paul, in Galatians, he said, if you get circumcised, Christ gained you nothing. But in book of Acts 16, he circumcised Timothy, Timotheus. Because his father was a Greek. Why did he say one place is Christ, if you get circumcised, Christ gain you nothing. And the other place that he circumcised one of his people. Because there they get circumcised for the wrong reason to keep the law. There they get circumcised to be effective in the kingdom. To have peace. To reach people. Paul, he says, I am everything for everyone to reach people. As a Jew, I ask am as a Jew, as a Gentile, I am as a Gentile. Somebody who was under the law, I am as somebody who's under the law, but I'm not under that law, but under the Christ, law of Christ. So Paul was there to reach people. And I will also write the same letter today. If I should write a letter to the church in Saudi Arabia, where women are wearing head covers, and I today to write a letter to them, and the story was that some of the women, when they came to faith, they took up the head covering and then they run around there and many people died because of that. I will write to them, keep that head covering because that is not the importance. I know it's provoking people, but Paul, shall we keep Sabbath? Is that important? Shall we, women, uh, wear head covering? Shall, uh, shall women be quiet? All of those things, first thing, Paul are addressing some of those issues, yes. But if this was a rule from every church all over the world, how, how, how could they know that? Because they did not have Paul's letters. It was actually only that church and some of those who actually had those letters. They did not have Paul's letter the first thousand years. Many of them, Paul, he went many places and Peter and John, and they, they went all over the world with the gospel. And they did not carry Paul's letter around. They did not have that tool to do that. I know it's challenging people. But what did they have? They have the Holy Spirit who are convincing people of sin, righteous, judgment, the Holy Spirit who is teaching people the truth. I have met many people, like myself, who did not have a good understanding of the Bible, but when they came to faith, they heard the gospel, repented, got baptized, received the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit started to deal with them, and the Holy Spirit convinced them the truth. And 
right away they stop lying. They stop cheating. They stop living in sin. The Holy Spirit convinced them of forgiving. The Holy Spirit convinced them of paying things back they have stolen. The Holy Spirit convinced them of being there for the kids, loving the family. The Holy Spirit convinced them of many things. But I have never met anybody who are new in the faith where the Holy Spirit suddenly convinced them, oh, now I need to cover my head. Or now I'm not allowed to drive a car on a Saturday or Sunday because it's Sabbath. Or now I should be quiet in, in the church because I'm a woman. I've never met anyone who had experienced the Holy Spirit had convinced them about that. Never. And we, I have only met people who have issues with this because we do not understand the Bible and then we take things out written to some people in some places and let it count for everyone and, some they, or, and they want to make rules out of it. There I meet it. But I never met anybody where the Holy Spirit is just convincing. And remember the early church did not have a full Bible. I know this is challenging for many people, but I want to say there is a freedom here. There is a freedom to understand what is important and what is not. There is a freedom to understand the culture. And of course the Bible is for us. And we can learn about that. And there is something in what Paul is saying about respect for each other in what he wrote with covering the head and the family. But it's not the letter we need to look at always, it's the heart behind the letter. And, and, and some of the things the Pharisees were really good at was, was looking at the outside things. I was just in Israel a short time ago, and, and we, we met the, the Pharisees. We were at the Wailing Wall where some of the Jews was, and I have a picture here. And what you can see here is they have something on their hand where they have a little box in the end of this, and you can also see on the head, you can see there and there, they have a little box on the head. In that little box on the head and that little box on the heart, they have, they have a small box with the Word of God in. They have written down and put in a box. Why? Because the Bible said that we should keep the Word in our heart and in our head, in our mind. <laughs> but when Jesus, when the Bible says, Meditate on the word. Keep it day and night. The law of God in your head and your heart. Do that mean that we should take it like a letter and understand it like that and take and write a word and put it on our head and near our heart? Was that what Jesus, what God was saying? No. It's not the outward thing. It's, we need to understand the, what is behind it. And this is where people sometimes make mistakes. And of course, I'm going to go into more details later also with, with, with Sabbath and, and women and ministry. But, but listen to the spirit behind and You have to understand that the Bible is a book that is written to different people in that situation they're living in. And, and, and I, my good friend David Parson, he has something called Unlocking the Bible, where you hear the teaching before about the story behind the book. And it's so good to know the story behind every book before you read the book. This is one thing. Another thing we need to know about the Bible is that we need to know that, that the Bible is, is a book, living book in that way that there is people who are learning and making mistakes and growing. And we need to also understand the order in that. We, the New Testament is put together like this. We had the four Gospels and then the History, Book of Acts, and then Paul's. And then the other, Ephesians, James, Pete, John, Jude, and then Revelation in the end. The reason it's put together like that is not because how it's written. It's put together like the longest book first, and then the shorter, 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 and then we end with Philemon, just, uh, just one chapter. So the Bible is put together like that, but Paul grow and Paul learn, like we are growing, like we are learning. And it's so good to try to read the Bible in, in context also. Here we can see Paul's letter, what he started with, 
And you can go on the internet and find that. And the last one is Second Timothy and, and Peter. And Peter wrote there, and then uh, yeah, those letters there. But what I want to say, so read the book in context, understand it. Because sometimes, for example, Book of Acts 8, Philip comes to Samaria. He preached the gospel, they repent and they get baptized. But he did not lay hands on them. So they did not receive the Holy Spirit. It's first when the apostle came, they lay hands on them. And they received the Holy Spirit. People today take that and build a big theology out of that and say, look, the Holy Spirit can only be given by the hands of the apostle because we have the proof in Book of Acts 8, the Holy Spirit can only be given by the hands of the apostles. That is not a proof. Why did Philip not lay hands on people so they received the Holy Spirit? I don't know. Why do you don't lay hands on people so they receive the Holy Spirit? And because I do it, it's not because I'm a pastor, but because I've learned to do it. And I think people, Philip learned to do it later. Philip was new in it. He was helping in Jerusalem and suddenly because of persecution, he ended up in, in, in Samaria. And I think that he, not, he did not know everything at that time. So we see that they are still learning. It needs to go with the early church 11 years before the first disciples understood that the gospel was also from the Gentiles. They first understood that 11 years after when Peter came to the house of Cornelius. So the first 11 years in those lives, they still have some glasses on. They thought that the gospel was only for the Jews, but it was actually for the Gentiles. And we cannot build theology out of that. Also, like, like somebody say, is it God's will to heal? No, no, because Paul in 2 Timothy 4 needed to leave somebody sick behind. And because he left somebody sick behind, it's not God's will to heal. Come on, we cannot use that example when we look at doctrines. Because Paul left somebody behind. Later, we, we read in, in Malta, he healed everybody who came to him. But why don't, you, why don't people use that example? Paul, he was not Jesus. We should imitate Paul as he imitated Christ. But there was area where Paul is learning and there was area where I'm learning. There's area where we are all learning and this is what I like with the book. The book is a real book about real people in real places. And it gives us a taste of the life. And the Bible is not meant to take every detail out and say, why did he say that? And then we, we get blinded, like we pick up a fly and we take that little fly and we get blinded and we say, why did Paul say that to those people at that time? And then we try to build theology on that one verse. That is wrong. The Bible is not meant like that. The Bible is meant to give us a big picture of the real life. I have some scriptures here. The Bible says it's the sum of God's word that's the truth. We read that in Psalms. The sum of your word is the truth. And then there's a, a principle the Bible is used again and again. Here Jesus is talking about when there's conflicts. That every word may be con Firm by the testimony of two and three witness. And I believe there is a truth in this. That is the sum of the word of God, that's the truth. And every word should be confirmed by two or three witnesses. We cannot just take one place, especially not out of context, context and build a big theology of that. We need to have two or three witnesses. We need to understand the word by seeing the big picture. And then the word is amazing. All scriptures, not only a few verses, but all scriptures is given by God. And scriptures, what are they? They are useful for teaching. It's useful for showing people what is wrong in their life. It's useful for correcting faults and teaching the right way to live. And this is some of the things that is amazing with the Bible. And now I'm going to continue and, and, and really, really challenge you. 
There is a big, 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 big problem with this Bible here. I believe some of the things that's written here is not from God. I think actually some of the things have destroyed the word. And what I'm thinking of there is, of course, the chapters and the verses. When Paul wrote, for example, Romans, he did not sit down and wrote to the church in Rome, chapter 1, verse 1. Verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, and then he comes to chapter 2. The Bible from the beginning on is written as full letters. From one person to somebody else, like we read letters today. And we have destroyed the Bible, I would say that, by putting chapters and verses in. And we now read the Bible in a way we are never been supposed to read it. If we go into the chapters and verses, chapters, it was first in the 1300. We got chapters in the Bible. I don't think Stephen was somebody, I don't want to go into a lot of detail there. We don't have time for that. But there was people who put chapters in the Bible. And now we have 1189 chapters in the Bible. A few hundred years later, we got the first um, verses in the Bible. And the first Bible we got with chapters and verses was in 1551. And now there's total 31,000 verses in the Bible. I would say God has not attended. Let's say it like that. If God wanted, if God thought that it was best for us that we had chapters and verses, why didn't he start with that from the beginning? But because chapters and verses, we have changed the whole way. And I, I don't, now, yes, I'm using chapters and verses, but, but I've seen that don't use it out of context. Use it in context. But what we do today, because of chats or verses, we have got a, a copy-paste Christianity. We go in and we find verses that suit us, and then we copy it and we paste it on a paper, and this is our life. And then we copy-paste there, copy-paste there, copy-paste there. And, and we can teach everything from the Bible now. But the Bible was not supposed to do it. So Paul started to write a letter to those people. He got a letter back. He wrote back again. And it was a conversation. Then he wrote to those people in their place, what they were standing in. Then he wrote to those people. And then he wrote to those people. And it was different what he wrote to different people in that situation they were in. But now we come later and we copy paste. So we take one verse there and one verse there and one verse there. And we put it together and suddenly we got a totally wrong view about doctrines, about God, about what it all is. And today, if you look at those churches here, some of the biggest church denominations in, in the world is the Catholic Church, 1.2 billion, Lutheran Church, 80 million, Baptist, 100 million, Pentecost, 280 million. If you look at those churches, They all have Bible scholars, they all have universities, they all have really, 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 really smart people who can greet and Hebrews, and still they don't come to the same thing. They still teach totally different things. Why? Because we all have our favorite doctrines we are built on. We all have our favorite verses. There is things they, they teach and they teach and they teach. And when people come out of those universities, they come out with the same classes. Because they have been taught, this, taught the same thing. When I meet people who have been on university and study theology, I sometimes make fun with them. I say, hey, tell me where you have studied and I tell you what you believe. It's like that. Because they come out, they go in, and then they get different verses, and then they come out. And we are all guilty in that in some way, and we need to stop doing that. We need to stop, stop 
pick and choose. We need to see the full picture of God. If you look at it like, like John 3.16, if I said that, everybody know that. If I said, what is John 3.16? Yeah, I know John 3.16, yeah. Okay, what, what do you read in John 3.14 then? Uh, what about John 3.36? We're talking about the wrath of God. No. <laughs> but there's so many things where, where we get a wrong picture of God. For some people think that there is churches today here who are preaching about the love of God, the love of God, the love of God, the love of God. Every Sunday, the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace, hyper grace, they just speak grace, grace. Those people who are sitting and listening, they get the idea that everything you read in the Bible is about love and love and love and grace. And they can do that every Sunday. Why? Because we do a sermon and then we pick scriptures out. And then we put scriptures into what we want to say. The early church could not do that because they did not have chapters and verses the way we do it. They did, not, yeah. they, they did it different. But there's also people here who are speaking about the fear of God, the wrath of God, the holiness of God, the fear of God, the wrath of God, the holiness of God, year after year, Sunday after Sunday, and they are blind and they think the only thing God is is wrathful and fearful. And there is no balance in it today. Why? Because people do not read the Bible by itself. They do not read it in context, letter by letter. I had a friend, Ronald, he set up like a thing for me, the natural, the, 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 the nature, so the nature of God, where he put some percent on what the Bible is teaching. If you take some of the words, it's not him who made it, he put it up there, but somebody have done that. If you look at the nature of God, it's actually interesting. We have here, God is as holy, 15%. God as faithful, 11%. God as judge, 17 God as powerful, 18 God as righteous, 16 God as judge, 14 God as love, 8 And it's actually interesting because I think if we should take people and say, try to do the same thing and put your percent on, God as love, there are some people that will say 80%. But there is also some people that will say 1%. And I think we need to get the Bible back to the common man. But we have the idea, no, no, it's dangerous to study the Bible yourself. You have to have scholars who know the Bible. No, because those scholars have glasses on. Because they come from the same university. And they preach what they have been taught. Like there, we need the life and we need the Holy Spirit to teach you. The Holy Spirit can teach you. And that is the amazing thing. If people are truly born again and have the Spirit of God, then they can read the Bible. And when they read the Bible, the Holy Spirit is teaching them. Those who need to experience more of the love of God, God can teach that through the Word. And those who believe more, need more the fear of God, God can teach that through the Word. So the Holy Spirit is teaching man. But what do we do today? Now we go on YouTube often and then we write in and we find sermons who fit us, we like to hear. And we get fed in one place and we are dying in another area. What I try with the Pioneer School is I try with the 20 lesson to take the big brush and paint the big picture about their life. Yes, I use scriptures and verses, but not our context. I use them to draw the big picture of their life so you may come to Jesus and have life. So you may obey him. But I get provoked because what do I see also? I see there's people who love the teaching about, about Book of Acts and about healing the sick and about kickstarting. And oh, of course, we love a lot of teaching about casting out demons. But we don't want to listen to the teaching about fear of God. We don't want to listen to the teaching about the holiness of God. We don't want to listen to the teaching about the covenant. No, no, we don't want to listen to that. We want to listen to the other teaching. 
And I actually became a little sad when, when I see that. Why? Because why? Come on, let's get it all. And if I get provoked, how, how do you think God will, will have it if you say that you pick and choose how you want him to be? You say, no, God, I only want your love nature. I don't want the rest. Please see all the lists on the Pioneer School. Please take the whole Bible and read the whole Bible from one end to another. I need to say that again and again and again. And before you study the Bible, before you read a book in the Bible, go in and see who wrote the book and who they wrote it to. Because then God can really speak to you and you can understand the word in a right way. And that is where you are, fi you are finding the sound doctrines. And I know I'm saying the same thing again and again and again here. Please read it all. Please do this. Please do this. But this is important. If we want to have the right picture of God and know the one true God and him who sent Jesus Christ, we need to have it all. And it's not enough to just focus on one thing and say, this is what I like, so therefore I will focus on that. And then suddenly you think God is love and everything is about love, 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 love. Or you focus on the righteousness of God or judgment of God and you think this is the only thing God is about. We need to have the sound doctrine and that is fine in the full picture. So I'm saying the same again and again because I want you to understand it. I'm going to end up now. Next time... We are going to go so much deeper into the chapters and verses. And you're going to see examples of how some of the doctrines we are building on today is wrong. And we're going to look at infant baptism. We're going to look at something other with baptism and sinner's prayer, of course. We're going to look at tithing. I know it's a dangerous thing to talk about. And we are going to look at speaking tongues. And that is some of the areas we are going to look at next time, where we are going to look at what people say, and then we are going to take those verses and try to look it in context, and then look at the life and what the Bible is actually saying about those things. So I hope you are ready next time and going to join when I'm going to continue on this and build on and look at many, many more details. Until then, Try to do what I'm saying, take Bible, book by book, read it through. I will not born again, find somebody who can baptize you in water with the Holy Spirit. Do you need to get kickstarted? Go out and do, go out and experience the life. Because when you have the life and then, as I say, read the Bible, it becomes so much more real. You understand it in a new way. And I think this is what we want. We don't want a lot of dry theology. But we want sound doctrines. But we want the life. We want to see Jesus real in our life. And, and I want to end up with a video Miles he made for us. I show a little clip when it came to the deliverance teaching I had. But he had put it together. I just a three minutes video where you see a woman uh, set free from a demon in Germany and walk without a cane. And I like that video because here we see scriptures from Roman 8 come together with life, where you suddenly see the Bible become life. It's not something that happened 2,000 years ago in Israel. It's something that's happening today. And this is not only with healing, that is to do with the whole thing of God. So God bless you. Hope you got something out of this. Hope you share this video because we need a reformation in the church. Also, when it comes to the Bible, how to read the Bible, share this video. And if you have questions and have some things about this and things you want me to cover, then really please write it to me as soon as you've seen this video, write it under the comments or something, because next week I will end up with this teaching and there I can start with answering some of your questions. God bless you and see this small video and see you next week. Bye bye. Come on, right now. Last thing go, says and leave her. Come on. I will not go. I will not Be go. Be quiet. Come on, right now. You are Come on. Go, 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 go. Come on. Come on, right now. Come on, you leave her. All right, come on. Try.
fight to walk. How is it now? <laughs> I don't know if you saw what just happened there. Ich weiß nicht, ob ihr gesehen habt, was jetzt hier gerade hier vorne passiert ist. There came a woman with a cane. Da kam eine Frau mit einer Krücke auf mich zu. And, uh, and the demon, uh, she fall down. Und sie uh, fiel dann hin. And the demon was shouting, she's mine, she's mine. Und der Dämon schreit aus ihr raus, sie ist mein, sie I ist don't mein. let go, I don't let go. Ich lasse sie nicht gehen, ich lasse sie nicht And gehen. And we I prayed. Aber ich habe gebetet. And the demon said, you are strong, you are strong. Und der Dämon sagte, du bist stark, du bist stark. And then in the end, it left. Und am Ende hat er sie verlassen. Was er. And she could walk without crosses. Und am Ende konnte sie ohne Krücke. If her right now in the name of Jesus, come out. Come out, come out, come out, come out, come out. Come out, come out, heal right now, heal right now, heal right now, heal right now, heal right now. Hey, hey, stop, look at me, stop, look at me, stop, look at me, now. What do you need? Your leg, okay, what is wrong with your leg? I don't know, since two months now, I can't walk, they say operation. Okay, close your eyes, just relax. Pray after me, God, God I, come to you. I come to you, I repent, I repent. and I ask you, I set me free, heal my body, come with the Holy Spirit, right now. Come on right now, last thing go, says and leave her, right now, every lie, every lie, every lie, come out, come out, I will not go. Be quiet, come out right now. Come out, be quiet right now. Be quiet and come out. Be quiet and come out right now. Be quiet, come out. Be quiet, come out. Come out, come out. Be quiet right now, come out. Be quiet, come out. Come out, come out. Come out right now, come out. Come out. Come out. Hi, come out. Try to walk, how is it now? Yes, 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 thank you, thank you, Lord. <laughs>